So let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Eric. My name is Claudio. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. From the studios in Fairfax City, we're very humble and grateful that Eric Schreen accepted our invitation to our show. Eric, welcome to the show, man. Hello, my dear friends. Thank you very much. Do you remember this one? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Eric, so, you know, we are coming out of in, in crazy time with the pandemic, with the COVID. You know, if you are a touring musician, you cannot travel, you cannot do gigs. You know, you cannot go outside. Some people believe in the vaccine, some people don't. And, and so, how, how, how COVID has affected your, your ability to go outside, to, you know, as a, as a musician, as a recording engineer? How's your sanity? How's, how are you holding up? Well, since I'm working as a remasterer, mixer, and so on since uh, 25 years now, um, the uh, pandemic was not too bad for me. Because all bands and artists uh, all over the world were close in their uh, rehearsal rooms and home studios and got the idea, well, we can play on stage, so we, uh, maybe we can record something. Gotcha. And since musicians may be good musicians, but not always good uh, recording engineers, it's then my turn <laughs> to correct it all. So I got a lot of productions from smaller studios and, and even rehearsal rooms done on laptops and other uh, cheaper equipment and uh, telling me, well, uh, we don't sound like Queen, but we want to sound like Electric Light Orchestra or something else. Can you help us? So I got more work than before. Yeah, wow. But that doesn't mean that I, <laughs> I'm a fan of this pandemic. I got my, my four vax now and uh, yeah. I'm very, very careful. And uh, thank God I, I didn't have it so far. But um, I know what uh, this pandemic has done to our music scene here because I'm connected to so many bands and, and they all take my old friends Gropschnitt. Mm -hmm. They are doing a new band now called Gropschnitt Acoustic Party. Yeah. And uh, they are playing the old th songs we did uh, back then in the 70s and 80s. They are playing with acoustic guitars. Yeah. It's the original yeah. singer, the original lead guitarist, and the son of the singer, a trio on acoustic guitars, playing everything, including solar music on acoustic yeah. guitars. Yeah. Of course, they asked me to join them. Well, how I don't find time for interviews, so I don't find time for rehearsings. But uh, they are doing it very well, but they have to push their concerts from spring into autumn due to the pandemic. They have to change, they have to get tickets back, they have to say the tickets are valid uh, in about a year. So I'm very close to this uh, horrible things this pandemic has done to the music scene. Yeah. Grosch, I believe that is, <clears throat> they're, they're touring a little bit in, in Germany, right? Nowadays? Yes. Yes, if they, can. <laughs> if they yeah. can. They are starting now, I, I think in May, they will start again with the... these uh, acoustic concerts. Yes. I got you. So where, where you came from, um, like a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you began taking, uh, let's say, piano lesson or drum lesson? How, how you began? I mean, where you it started not, uh, yes, I, I, I didn't start with instruments. I started yeah. with the technique, with the technical things. Yeah. It started all when I was seven or eight years old. It was in 19, oh, it was 1956. And uh, somebody gave me a very strange thing. I can show you what yeah, I got. Yeah. Of course. It's over here in the, the other studio. Yeah. And yeah. I can show you what I mean. When I was a kid, something like that. Can you see? Yeah. Well, it's an old valve radio. Yeah. I, as a kid, I, I was sitting before this machine and listened and listened to the music coming out. Yeah. And the first thing I uh, listened, the first song ever I heard on this radio was uh, She's my little Sheila. Da, 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 da. Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. Sheila. Tommy Rowe? No. Doesn't matter. I listened to the music, but I wondered how can the music come out of this box? Sure. And I looked from, from behind, behind right? and I opened it and I saw some strange things inside glowing and blooming. And uh, I wanted to um, 
find out how the music comes out of this box. And so I started my hobby radio as a child. And it developed into radios, which I still have today in my collection. I also uh, own pirate stations and all that stuff in my whole life. But radio and sound and um, speakers and uh, later recordings, tape decks, that was my life before I switched to active music. That happened at school many years later when I was 14. Then uh, uh, my next neighbor in the class, by the name of Lupo, he sat beside me, uh, he came into the class one day with a Hofner three pickup red guitar. And he was the hero of the whole school. And uh, he could play a few chords, of course. <laughs> what, what did he play um, from the animals? Uh, House of the Rising Sun, which That's everybody right. plays on the guitar. <laughs> everybody played that, right? Yeah. yeah. And you, we were impressed uh, up to the ceiling. And so um, he said, uh, I want to make a band. Uh, what, what Will you join the band? What can you do? I said, I can do nothing. I have a radio, but uh, no instrument. Oh, well, what, what, what do you want to play? I said, I want to play bass. Why? Yeah, it hasn't so much strings like a guitar. And the three strings are bigger, so it's probably easier to play. So I started out learning bass at the age of 14, but uh, it really didn't satisfy me because, uh, you know, if you start learning on a bass with new fingers, uh, the next day they are hurting and uh, the next week you have bubbles on the fingers. Right. <laughs> you know. And uh, then happened something strange. Uh, Lupo had some friend uh, who possessed a drum kit. The father was a baker and the drum kit was set up in the baking room behind. And I entered this room and was so impressed about so many red sparkling drums. And I said, wow. And then he started beating on or something. It was so unbelievable loud. <laughs> we also pressed our hands to our ears. And I said, ah, this is great. That's much better than bass. And then I dreamt I would be a drummer. And that was at the age of 15. With and then I started drumming. interesting for drumming. I bought a used kit. First, I drummed like every young drummer on uh, buckets and <laughs> on, on pots, cooking on pots and stuff, yeah, right. spoons. Yeah. But uh, very soon I, I um, achieved a, a small used kit with real cymbals and drums and uh, then started uh, out in a, in, in a church, in an old church room somewhere in downtown Hagen, playing drums. My first heroes were Ginger Baker and Keith Moon. Yeah, and I studied what are they doing? How does Ginger Baker work on the drums with his uh, hi hat always making these 16 bars? And I was so obsessed that I uh, rehearsed every each and every day. I also quit school far too soon just for being able to rehearse on my drums. Really? And Lupo, yeah. yeah, really. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you say it. We call it Schule Schwänze. If we leave the school before it ends. Really. And what your parents said? Uh, no, they didn't know. <laughs> no, my parents were uh, quite tolerant in, in uh, the case of music. And Lupo and me, we started to play together. He on his guitar, me on my drums. He didn't have a guitar amplifier, but I built some old tube radio as an amplifier for him. So he could play with this radio. It was loud enough against the drums. And then we started making music. And uh, we I even have an original tape recording from 1965 when we two are playing House of the Rising Sun, Lupo with his guitar and me on drums. Wow, what a story. Man. And we were the first uh, founding members for this band, which later developed into Kopschnitt. And we are still friends. He's living uh, five minutes from here. Oh, and what, what kind of music? That's that's a good story. What kind of music were you listening when you were? I think in Germany they call it the gymnasium, right? The equivalent of the high school kid, right? So, what? Well, what, um, we what were in the were lucky. Uh, what I listened well, we were in the very lucky position over here. We had lost the war, yeah. and so because we had lost the war, we didn't 
have to listen to march music <laughs> anymore we could listen to the allied forces radio stations we had american forces radio british forces radio and around our area here canadian forces radio and they all played that hot stuff they played all that jazz and they played uh, the upcoming beat and they played uh, swing and whatever in a very cool mood which the german stations just weren't able to do German stations were stiff and uh, now comes in use. <laughs> and AFN was, hey, now let's, let's have some good music. Down it goes. And all the kids were listening to the actual American and British charts over here. Yeah. Uh, British uh, BFPS top 20 every Saturday. And each one of us was uh, sitting in front of his radio. And I was lucky because of my hobby, I had a tape recorder and I could tape all those tracks, all those songs, which the whole school liked and could uh, so um, tape it also for my classmates. I was lucky enough very soon to have two tape recorders. My parents gave me one for Christmas and the next one for the next Christmas. So I had two tape recorders and was able to copy. So I could record the music, copy the tapes from all my friends. And so we developed into the contemporary uh, US British music scene, upcoming Beatles, upcoming uh, uh, Stones, upcoming Kinks, The Who, Yardbirds, whatever came up in the 60s. And so I developed into the 60s music, which are my main roots. Good, beautiful story. And then, and then from there, right? Lupo and yourself, how the other member became, and then you, you guys began, you know, a uh, growth in 1970. How, how the band came together? How you approached the um, other people? In the 60s, we started out as a band called The Crew. Yeah. That was a, a beat band, you can call it beat band, mm, formed of Lupo, me, and some classmates. Yeah. Because uh, we were not alone on this planet. We talked about our music at school and they, oh, wow, we, we want to hear it. Can we, uh, can we have a listen? And so some other um, schoolmates who, oh, maybe one had also a guitar. He came and said, may I join you for, for an hour? And so it formed together. And um, we were looking for a singer uh, a few weeks later, which came into our rehearsal and... Uh, right, to uh, show what he can, uh, that was Wildschwein. Yeah. He came very early in 1966, and so we had our first band consisting of Lupo, me, Wildschwein, the later Grobschnitt singer, yeah. a, a bass player, and one other classmate who was, uh, who was involved in Grobschnitt a little bit too later, and we started out as a band playing on weekends for dancing in clubs, small clubs and small pubs, and uh, even uh, some small uh, assembly halls, and but regularly, nearly each weekend, because we didn't have money. <laughs> my drum set, my first drum set, it costed about 300 Deutschmarks, which was about $300 back then. And um, we had a music store in our city who was very tolerant to young bands. He said, you can have this and you can have this amplifier and you pay step by step by step like you can earn your money. So we had to play to pay our equipment. Of course, yeah. And so we played every weekend and sometimes also on the holidays, Christmas, with our beat band, the crew. And that, this lasted for over three years. And we had hundreds of beats and were rather professional. We went on stage and were known for our very good sometimes very wild wild music and also wild show. We also did show before Grobschnitt in this beat band. And uh, the crew lasted until October 1969. Good. And then we did a very uh, good festival in downtown Hagen. And this festival was our last gig. Uh, I have recorded the festival. You can also have it on CD in my live series. And after that, we split. We hated each other. I don't want to see Lupo anymore. Lupo didn't want to see me anymore. We went off. Really? And everybody did his own thing for almost a year. 
I developed a little into free jazz uh, with uh, Hans Reicher, German guitar player, in of the free jazz experimental scene. And Lupo formed a three uh, member trio with a bass player and drummer called Cherry Cross. And Wildschwein uh, went off to holidays. But uh, a year later, we met again. I contacted Wildschwein. I said, Do you want to join my, my strange music ideas with? was a violin player and free jazz guitarist. And well, he liked it, but he said, we, we need a little more, more power and maybe a good guitarist. Yeah, who is a good guitarist? Yeah, Lupo. Have you seen Lupo? No, I didn't see him for, for, for one year now. So I called Lupo and then we went, got together. And Lupo said, I have a three man band called uh, Taring Cross, drummer, bass player and me. And I said, well, I'm a drummer too. I have Wildschwein and uh, some violin player. I said, we put it together. So we have two drummers. And that's what we did. And we played from the beginning of 1971. We played as Charing Cross with two drummers. Yep. Lupo's yeah. bassist called Bear, which later was the first bassist from Grobschnitt. Wildschwein as a singer. And... We played as Charing Cross, and then the name Grobschnitt was invented, and the first gig of Grobschnitt was in April 71, Easter Monday, 71. We changed our name from Charing Cross to Grobschnitt. And then, uh, how was the, 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 that's great, but how was the reception of that type of music down there in Germany? Because it was the beginning of you know, Grofsky before uh, the album in 72 and Bollerman in 74. It was, you guys were very different to uh, to many of the local bands, I suppose, right? Yes. How was, how was, how was the music received? Well, um, the crew was, uh, had two, uh, two hearts in, in their chests. Um, on one side, we had to play the known uh, songs from the chart. The yeah. people wanted to hear Beatles songs. The people wanted to hear, example given, uh, do you know Land of the Thousand Dances from Wilson Pickett? Na, 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 na. I had to play it with a hi-hat, 60s, but I had to play it for half an hour. Half an hour, because people were dancing and screaming. We couldn't stop the song. That's yeah. what we did. We played the songs that people knew, because yeah. they wanted to dance. On the other hand, we were very um, conscious of the upcoming psy psychedelic scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. Bands like uh, Electric Prunes and, and uh, The Love and, and these bands and more experimental things. So we also did own compositions, which were a little bit strange and a little, little bit funky sometimes, loud and experimental. So we played the, those two things. The regular program and our own improvised music. music, which in some cases also was uh, were the roots of solar music. Yeah, the typical riff in, in in D minor occurred at the crew sessions already in 1968. My God! And um, when we formed Grobschnitt, we decided what to do. No, we didn't want to play uh, charts anymore. We wanted to concentrate on our music, but we didn't want to be too experimental, which also depended on, let's say, uh, the bass player. He, he had a classical bass uh, uh, study and he also could play uh, cello and violin. And he said, we want, have to do some, some classical influences. And I said, I, I, don't, I would like to drum a little more swing, you know, which I couldn't do at the crew times. And so we developed into this early Grobschnitt style with two drummers and a little classical experimental, if you listen to uh, Sun Trip, experimental style, but also songs. Uh, our bass player could play flute, so we made uh, the track Wonderful Music for the flute bass playing. And uh, it was a development which was necessary because we as uh, artists uh, had stock stuck long enough to uh, the chart music. Wow. So it, it was a development. 
Yeah. And since we were very known here in our area and the city and the cities beyond, uh, we could play what we want. The house was, was full. Remember when we uh, played as crew downtown in Hagen in one location, uh, the location was designed for 400 people maximum. We stuffed it with more than 1,000 people. Wow. At the weekends. They all stood there and they stood outside uh, in front of the doors and they couldn't move, but it was so hot. And <laughs> today it wouldn't be possible anymore to, to overcrowd such a place, but we were always sold out so we could do what we want. The people, people expected us to uh, set new trends and, and show them what, what's new in kind of music. So we couldn't play what we like, and uh, we always had success. Good. Were, were your parents happy that you, you, you were doing well? You know, I, I had a stepfather, and he was really old, and uh, he always said, uh, You with your Beatles music, bah, 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 bah. I can't stand it. He was uh, from the times of the uh, German Third Reich, and he liked marching music and things like this. So we were very controversy, yeah. but he was a very, very, very good guy. And one of the best humans I ever met, he was very educated, and but he didn't like the speed music. But um, then, uh, as you know, I had my solo hit later, this instrumental with the accordion. Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, since um, my stepfather worked also night shift, he came home late at night in the morning and listened to his little radio in the kitchen <laughs> while we were sleeping, and he heard my hit on the radio each day. And he said, well, I have heard your song again on the radio. So he was thinking, well, what they are doing. And I swear you, some months later, he was sitting in first row at the Grobschnitt concerts when we played the big uh, areas here, the big venues with two, five thousand people. He sat in the first row and said, it's far too loud, but it's great. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> and it, it was, was, was it Difficult, uh, Eric, to get like a, a record label interested in your music. I mean, when you were selling crowd of from 800 to 1,000 to 5,000, yeah. a record label noticed and they, I, I assume they say, man, these guys are, are very good. We need to send them to our, our record label, right? Or not? Well, uh, we were not interested in making records. Really? It was so, no, we, we wanted to make music and to play live with the people records. Well, Records is for uh, country music or what? No, um, no, we were not interested in such things. We wanted to make our music, and uh, records were for those big acts like Beatles and they do and Stones. They have records, but not the crew from Westphalia. So it was not in our heads. But uh, when we had formed Grobschel in 1971, the discussion came up, of course. And the story is told before, but I can tell you again. Um, we said we would like to have a record to show what we are doing to people we can't reach with our concept presently. Of course. Probably people in southern Germany or probably people in the Netherlands or even over the big swamp in the US, wherever. So we thought, how can we do it? So it was my turn again, because I had tape recorders. I had bought a new one, a Ravox machine, and could make very good recordings, which I did each day, because we recorded each uh, rehearsal to, to listen what we have done and how we can get better. So we decided to record some songs as demos for a record company. So first thing was I recorded, Great recording, sounded fine, but how to get a record company? Well, Lupo and me and uh, the bass player sat down in Lupo's tiny car with the tape under the, under the arm in the suitcase and said, okay, where are record companies? In Munich? Yes. In Cologne? Yes. In Hamburg? Yes. In Berlin? Maybe. Uh, but Berlin, there's the Iron Curtain? No, we don't want to go to Berlin. Munich, uh, well, Munich is far away and they can't talk German. They are talking Bavarian. <laughs> That's not our thing. <laughs> Hamburg, yeah. 
And we knew Hamburg. We had played there already and said, Hamburg is uh, north. Clear air, no mountains. We drive to Hamburg. And so we drove to Hamburg without an address. <laughs> and in Hamburg, we went, uh, I think we, we, we overnight, we had a tent or something beside the highway. We, we didn't have money, you know, for a hotel. In Hamburg, we went into the next telephone booth with a telephone a book and looked after record companies. Wow. And then Lupo <laughs> called up uh, some company. It was called Polydor or so. Hey, we are a band. We have a tape and we want to play it to you. And they said, well, uh, you can come in about an hour. <laughs> wow, and so you went there. To, we went there and played the, the, the tape with our two drummers recorded to uh, the uh, A&R of Polydor. And he said, oh, well, quite good, but... Uh, Honestly, said what you are you two what you are doing with two drummers in Hamburg, each band can do it with one drummer. <laughs> and drove back home. <laughs> it was okay, but uh, Grotschild had one big uh, habit: they never gave up. So a few weeks later, we drove again to Hamburg, looked again into the telephone book, and found some. Um, music publisher called Slazak Publishing. And he said, well, come, come over to us. Uh, you can have coffee and cake and we talk a little bit. And he listened to the tapes and he said, well, it's interesting. I knew a company probably which would be interested in such kind of music because it has a little classical attach and is, is interesting with two drummers. And he said, go to metronome music. Metronome, yeah. The label which was founding Brain right at that time and was looking for interesting bands. Yeah. So the next day we drove to Metronome. Uh, the, uh, the boss of Metronome, a uh, guy called Bruno Wendel, huge guy, invited us, sit down, looked at us and said, uh, you are looking a little hungry. Are you starving? Uh, we didn't have enough <laughs> food. So he said, uh, Miss, Miss uh, Smith, Come on, uh, cake and food for the band. Before we do anything, they have to eat. <laughs> so we sat in the office of this, uh, uh, I remember, and we had cake and coffee. and Oh, it was nice. And then he listened to our tape. And he said, interesting. He said, we will sign you. Wow. But you have, you can record, we will sign you. You get a studio, we will pay the studio, but you have to have a producer because you are absolutely unexperienced with studio recording, producing, and so on. And he um, he um, he knew some guy playing guitar for a German band called the Rattles, the new Rattles, not the old ones. The old ones were different. And this guy was very experienced in studio called Frank, Frank Miller, and he became our producer. The guy in the background who delegates in the studio what's to be done and uh, the link between engineer and technique and so on and so on. So we played our demo to metronome music. I think it was in, um, in April or, or May 1971. And by the end of 71, we were in the studio in Hamburg, in the Windrose Studios, and recorded our first album. A dream had come true. <laughs> My God, man, what an unbelievable story. They <clears> also <throat> had a good engineer called Connie Plank. Yeah, of course, was, I know who, who he was. Yeah. yeah, who was at that time looking for, for, for a job because he was new in the scene. And Metronome had, had uh, said, well, we are founding the Brain label and you can work for the Brain bands and uh, exclusively. So you got uh, a dozen of jobs now. And then it started all up by the end of 1971. And we were in this boat together yeah. with other bands, you know. My God. So you guys drove back from Hamburg, you and Lupo, to your hometown and told the other guys, hey, we got a record label. We got yes. a record deal. Yeah, of course. My God, man. Yeah, they, yeah, we had a telephone back then, a normal telephone. Yeah. Oh, okay. so we phoned back and said, well, we got it. Yeah, now what to do? Yeah, we have to rehearse now. And we rehearsed each and every day and night to, um, and then when we went into the studio and <laughs> we recorded our symphony in one hour and, and that was done. And Cody Plant said, I have never seen a band who can play, uh, who comes in and plays and it's perfect. 
We were very, very good trained at that time. Yeah. Good for you. And that was the beginning of a long friendship between Connie and me, you know. Yeah. Connie we passed were... away, right?